All right, we just have this one problem that's due on Friday. Um, so what we want to do here, we've got this shaft that's lifting that mass um, at 90 RPM. And, and we want to find the torsion and power developed by the shaft and also the maximum shear and normal stress. So this is some pretty basic design here that you might do, okay? Um, now, I might be mistaken here, but um, I think, yeah, I've got a little bit of, I've got a rate that isn't shown here. There's a radius on this uh, pulley, isn't there? Or a diameter of the pulley, is it a nine centimeter diameter on your homework, on your yeah. handout? Okay. So um, I'm always changing this thing around, and that, that's not on here. So what we got here, we've got nine centimeters, right? And see, that's where the rope extends from. And so you're going to want to find the weight. And what you're going to want to do is find the torsion based on that. Now, keep in mind one thing here that what you were given was a mass. What you want to work with to find the torsion is a weight. And the torsion is the moment around the center of the shaft, okay? So I'll just let you run the numbers on that. Just be sure that you do that. I, I think it's important that everybody understand how uh, torsion works. But it should come out to be 90 or 82.4 Newton meters, okay? And no, I'm, I've got that wrong too, don't I? I'm sorry. What happened? I, I've got an old copy here. I don't think this applies anymore, does it? Um, so I think what we're looking for here is 124 Newton meters. There we go. Okay. All right. Now, another thing that we've got here is we've got 90 RPM, which, you know, you're, you might be familiar with if you look at your tachometer on your car or something. That's what that's reading out in. And it's a pretty normal unit, especially if you're used to, uh, working on cars or de dealing much with machinery but the problem with it is is that we don't really use that uh, in the equations that we work with so much so what you want to realize here is that 90 rpm what an rpm is is a revolution per minute okay it's one full turn of a circle for a revolution in a minute's time so basically, you know, if you have a point on this thing, it's rotating 90 times in a minute is what that's saying. Now, what we want to do, though, is get that into radians per second, okay? So that's the units we want. And when you do that, you should come up with 9.424 radians per second, okay? So we'll do a couple conversions there to get to that point. All right, so should we okay with that? All right, now the next step here is to figure out the power. Now what the power is, is the torsion times the angular speed. And um, what you want to do then is just run those numbers, and that's easy enough to do, and you'll come up with uh, 1165 Newton meter per second. Which I believe is a watt, okay? So you'll just have to run some numbers on that. So that's the power that this thing is putting out. So that's the required output of the motor, basically. Okay. So if you're sizing a motor, you'd probably convert that into horsepower, and that's that's how you'd size your motor. Okay, because motors are rated on what they put out, is what they're rated on, of course. The the power they can deliver. All right, and then the last little thing here is you've got tau max which also is equal to sigma max and that's equal to the torsion times the radius divided by i now i've had a, sometimes I've had a couple people now ask me um what the 
which radius to use on these hollow shafts, and it's come up for a couple times now. The, the deal with that is you use the biggest radius because that gets you the biggest shear, which is what you really want to you know to deal with, if you know what I mean. I mean so generally speaking, you're after tau max, and tau max occurs on the outer edge of the shaft, and that occurs at what you might call R max, the biggest radius. And if you kind of look at that, you can see that the bigger you make the radius, the, the larger the value you'll get there. So, so you use the maximum outer radius for that stuff. Okay. All right. So that's the, the basic drill on that. Are there, are there questions on that? No? Yeah. To find the first torque the heat 1.4. Right. Um, what, what are you going to do to find that? Like, Okay, what, what, what you're after is the moment around the center of the shaft. It's just a moment, but it's a very particular one, and it's about the long central axis of the shaft, because it causes the shaft to wrap up. Oh, okay. So it's just a you know, force times distance thing. Right. Other questions on that? Okay. So, okay, so that's that one. All right, now we got some torsion to finish up here, so let's see if we can get through that today and maybe a little bit more besides, but let's, um, let's start finishing up that one problem we kind of ran out of gas on on Friday. We didn't quite uh, finish it. All right. Okay, this is one where what our goal here is to size the shaft. So let's find the uh, how big of a shaft we need on this. It's this one right here. And on what, what page are we on? Can you tell me? 680. So we're on 680 is where we're at. All right, now as I was mentioning, whenever I'm doing this torsion stuff, I always think first about, um, about units. So I got that 90 revolutions per minute. Well, you don't use that in the in the formulas in this in what I'd call the standard straight up formulas. You need conversion factors if you're going to use that. And I've seen formulas in handbooks and stuff that have conversion factors built right into them. But but in the ones you get out of a textbook, they don't. So you got to get that into radians per second. So two pi radians per revolution, one minute to 60 seconds. That'll get you. 9.425 radians per second. So that's the angular speed that you would put into a formula. Okay. All right, now the same thing here with a uh, horsepower is that's not a natural unit. Okay, if horsepower is, as I think we were talking about that, it's the power of a horse. It's what an old draft horse could lift and the speed it took it to lift the weight. It's really what that is. So we want to get that converted into foot pounds per second. Okay. All right, we've got the length of the shaft, but that's four feet. But we don't want to be using that because when I'm in the, uh, when I'm doing this, when I'm in, if I'm in metrics, I want everything newton meters and seconds. And if I'm in English, I want everything pounds, inches, and seconds. And the reason for that is most of the diameters on shafts and the moment of inertia calculations and all that you do are in inches. So rather than converting all those into feet, I convert all my feet lengths into inches. It's just simpler, okay? So on everything in inches, okay, I've got G there. It's 12 times 10 to the minus 6. I've also got that 2.578 degrees. I want to get that into radians, okay? So, so there's a fair amount of unit conversions to do on this, and, and there often are in torsion problems. So, so I just go ahead and do all that stuff, okay? So four feet, don't get that into 48 inches. G is 12 times 10 to the six pounds per inch squared. That's the uh, shear modulus there. I've got uh, phi for uh, the maximum level of phi is 0.045 radians. All right. So so that's kind of some of the stuff I've got going on here. Now I know what the shaft is putting out. It's 82,500 foot pounds per second. 
and I know the angular speed of the shaft. So I can figure out what the torsion is, and that's probably what I'll be doing next year. Because we're, you know, we're, when we're dealing with shafts, we deal with torsion design. So I'll go ahead and do that. So if I take the power and divide it by omega, I can get the torsion, and I got it in foot pounds, and then I convert it into pound inches, because that's often the unit that I work in. So what I just did there on that this slide here is a whole bunch of unit conversions, and I found the torsion. By knowing the power, I divided it by the angular speed, and that got me the torsion. Okay. Okay. So now I can start to figure this out. Now I got to find the minimum allowable shaft diameter. Okay, now basically what's going to happen here is that's going to involve two things. I'm looking for the radius, which is in the formulas, okay? So that's two times the radius is the diameter, obviously. But also, the other thing I'm going to be looking for is the moment of inertia. See, both of those things are going to factor into this. Because even though it says like TR over I on your shear formula, and TL over I, um, IG, I think it is, on the angular formula, or what is that angular formula? Um, yeah, T, yeah, TL over IG, okay? Even though those are written out as I, see, they involve the radius, see? The radius goes into the moment of inertia. So I want to get that moment of inertia formula expressed in terms of the radius. That way I can solve for the radius, because that's really what I'm going to do here. I'm going to solve for the radius. So the first formula I'll deal with here is the shear formula. It's TR over I. And I want to express I as what it is. It's pi over 2 R to the 4. So I'll get 2 TR over pi R4. And I've got an R on the top and an R to the 4 on the bottom. So I'll cancel the R on the top with one of the R's on the bottom. Okay, so I'll cancel that with this and I'll make that 3. So I'll get that tau max is 2t over pi r3. So what all I did there was take that i formula, i sub p, p meaning polar, and change it into pi over 2r to the 4, and then just work through the numbers on that. That's, that's about all I did. Okay. Okay. So I get tau max is 2t over pi r3. I can d multiply both sides of the equation by r3 and divide both sides by tau max. So I did that in one step. So I get r3 is 2t over pi tau max. And I can take a third root. So what I have there is a, just a little handy formula to find the radius based on knowing the torsion and the shear. And I know both of those things because I know what tau max is and I know what the torsion is requirements are. So I can work through that and back into what the radius needs to be. Okay. So I just go ahead and plug into that. So the radius is the third root of two times the torsion, which is I want that in pound inches, so 105,000 pound inches, divided by pi, and then divided by tau max, which is 8,000 pounds per inch squared. And what I come up with is 2.03 inches. All right, so the shaft radius needs to be just a shade over two inches. If it's below two inches, I'll have too much shear buildup in that shaft, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm converting the moment of inertia formula into a function of the radius, you know, which it is, and then I'm um, solving for, for the radius after I do that. So what I just found there based on the shear formula is that the shaft needs to be 2.03 inches in radius. If it's any smaller than that, I'll have too much shear buildup. Okay? And what I can do is I can do the same thing for the angle formula. Same idea. Just put the moment of inertia in terms of R, extract R for the equation and solve for it, and then plug the stuff in and see what the radius has to be for the twist angle. Okay? So I can do that. So we're doing all right with that.
Yeah. Uh, so if you do do that method, uh, will you get a different result and have to? Um, yeah. Right. The... Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. These and sometimes people get a little confused on that. These two things are not tied together. They're completely separate requirements. I got the radius required for the shear, and I got the radius required for the torque for the uh, angle. And those values can be anything. I don't know what they're going to be. So you know, they're not the angle and shear requirements are not tied together in any direct way. So I solve for both of them separately. Would we would the one that governed be the smaller one? No, or the see, larger one? bigger one. Because if if my if my currently what I've got is if that um, if that radius is any smaller than 2.03, I'll have too much shear. So I can't let it go under 2.03. And I'll do a similar thing for the angle. We'll see what's up with that, okay? All right, so we good? All right, and it's just the same thing. And, you know, I just kind of walk through that step by step. So phi is TL over IG. I is pi over 2 R4. So I bring the 2 up to the top because, you know, it's in the denominator on the bottom of a fraction, so that, that pulls on up. So 2 TL over pi R4G. Solve for R4, it's 2TL over pi phi G. Take the fourth root now. And that is one thing I'll mention. You know, have a look at your calculator and be sure you can find roots with it, you know, but you know how to do that on there. That's something that we might do in this class. So for the calculator you've got for your homework, but also if you're going to use one on a test, just be sure you can take a third root or a fourth root on it if you need to. Okay. And I just plug everything in. So 2 times the torsion times the length in inches divided by pi divided by the angle divided by g, and I get 1.56 inches. Okay. So what this says, if I have a shaft any smaller than 1.56 inches, it'll twist up too much. Okay. It'll, it'll have too much angle of twist. So now I've got two criteria, okay? And as we were just talking about, they're not directly related. So I just, and so the general rule, again, when you're designing stuff, go with the smallest load or the biggest size. That's how you design things safely, okay? So I'll go with the two point, was it 03 inches? Okay. So I can't, you know, I, I can't go any smaller than that because if I do, I'll have too much shear stress based on my allowable shear. All right, so um, go with go with the big one, 2.03. So the minimum allowable diameter has got to be 4.06. Okay. Now that's an answer, you know, out there in in industry. I, I hate getting answers like that because shafts come in probably nice even increments, right? And so there's probably a four inch shaft, and I don't know what the next one up is. I don't haven't really done much of this, but maybe four and a half or something. I hate, you know, if I'm going to manufacture this, I'm going to make 10,000 of them. That's going to start to add up if I have to start using a four and a half inch shaft. So I'm going to, you know, in, in out there in industry, I'm going to have a look at some of my assumptions that went into this. I'm not going to do anything uh, brash or, or, or dumb or anything, but I'm going to look at it. Can I get away with a four inch shaft? And I'll start looking at some things there to see if I could do it. Okay. Maybe a uh, little less power out of the shaft, something to get it down to four inches, because you know that just be might be a more convenient size to work with. Yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, right. There's always some some factors that go into this when you start saying the allowable shear is this, and the allowable twist angle is that. Well, is it really? You know. And, and, you know, my, I remember my professor when I was in school used to talk about your engineering judgment, you know, he used to say that. And we, we finally asked him if he could buy some of that at the bookstore. <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, so something like that, you know. So in, in industry, I, I'd, I'd look at that number a little bit and see what, what it really meant and what I could do with it. Okay. All right. So we good with that? So we're just working the equations different directions here. The normal thing to do is just plug in numbers and find phi and find tau. But if you know phi and tau, you can back in and find the radius. That's the deal with this one. Okay. Just run the equation the other direction. A little bit more complicated because you've got to do these roots and all that kind of stuff. But 
All right. Now, one other thing we'll look at here, and that's statically indeterminate relationships. So let's say I've got a round shaft and I've got, you know, attached at, on two walls, and I'm going to apply that torsion. Let's see what we can, let's see what these relationships are. Um, if I know what torsion I'm applying to this thing, what, what are the reactive torsions of the wall? Okay. So this is just like statically indeterminate stuff. But it's uh, it's for a shaft this time. So we'll use similar a similar approach, but we'll um, do it for torsion instead of the normal stress type equations. And um, and you know something kind of interesting. Um, there's an angle formula, right, for for a shaft. Now sometimes they call angles angular deformations. What's the axial deformation formula? Delta is what? Instead of torsion, what do you got? Load? You got length, right? Instead of moment of inertia, that which is what resists twisting. That's one way to define a moment of inertia. What, what do we got that resists the, that load area? And uh, torsion is all about twist. Um, axial stress is not. It's all about normal stress. So instead of the shear modulus, you got the modulus elasticity, right? I mean, those are analogous equations. They're the same sort of thing. Okay. All, right. all right. So let, let's have a look here at this. So um, and let's let's look at what's going on. Now, generally speaking, if we have a shaft, and unless we apply apply the torsion right in the middle, um, what's going to happen here? is the the gammas, the shear strains, are not the same. So if you factor them up by G and get the shear, because G times gamma is the shear, the shear is defined as, um, or excuse me, the shear modulus G is tau over gamma, so G is equal to tau times gamma. Or excuse me, I'm sorry, the shear stress is equal to G times gamma. That's what I meant to say. All right, so if gamma AC is not equal to gamma BC, then if you multiply through by G, they're not equal. So that means the shear stresses are generally not equal in this situation. But what is equal is the angle, because there's one angle of twist at C. If you look at what's going on at C, if we apply a torsion like that, this point's going to roll down to another point, to C prime. And if you look at that, there will be some angle of twist from C to C prime. And it doesn't matter if you measure the angle starting at A going this way or starting at B going that way. It's the same angle. There's one angle there at C. You can measure it two different ways. You can measure it from A to C or you can measure it from B to C, but it's the same angle. And that's the deformation relationship we're going to use here. That the twist measured from A to C equals the twist angle measured from B to C. They're the same thing. Now, when we did the axial stuff, you know, we had to kind of look at this and see what the relationship was between the deltas, if you remember that. Sometimes you use similar triangles, sometimes they are equal, sometimes they're this and that. But this, but with torsion, there's not that much variability. It's always the angles equal each other. Okay, that's all there is to it. Okay. All right, so let's work through one of these. What's on the next page there? I'm on page 690 before that. So what we're going to do, we're going to apply this torsion in the middle, and we know the maximum allowable shear in the shaft is 70 megapascals. Let's see how much torsion we can apply here. So if we know the shear in the shaft can only, can only go up to 70 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared, 70 megapascals, let's find the maximum torsion we can apply. All right. See, what's going to happen here when we apply that torsion in the middle, there'll be reactive torsions coming back the other way. 
and we're going to use those to analyze each side of that shaft. Okay. So we got to figure out what those are, and then we got to relate that to the maximum shear that can build up. So let's kind of have a look here. First, let's find those moments of inertia. 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter diameters. Take half of that, convert it to meters. Take it to the fourth power uh, times pi over 2, and we get the moments of inertia. 1.57 times 10 to the minus 8, and 25.13 times 10 to the minus 8, and those are meters to the 4. So start with that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do that kind of statically indeterminate thing here using strengths. I mean I've got, see I'm statically indeterminate. That's what's happening here. I've got two reactions, but I only, I only got one equation to find that with, so I need a second equation. <laughs> so the second equation that I use is I use the twist equation and set the angles equal to one another. So the torsion from A to C times its length, 0.2 meters, divided by I and divided by G from A to C is going to equal the torsion on the right, BC, times its length, 0.5 meters, divided by its moment of inertia, divided by its uh, G. Okay. So based on that, what I know is the torsion from A to C is 0.1562 times whatever the torsion from B to C is, and I can invert that. The torsion in BC is 6.399 times whatever the torsion in AB is. Okay. So it looks like BC can handle more torsion. It's bigger, primarily, okay, also longer. Now those ratios will always hold because the twist angles are, um, are from A to C is the same as the twist angle from B to C. Okay. All right. Now, now the next thing I got to do is I got to look at what the maximum torsions are for each side. Now this is just taking the shear equation and rearranging it like so. That's really all that is. So I'm just going to take that shear equation, and I know what the shear is, how high it can go. So I'll just uh, solve for the torsion. So I'm going to find the torsion on each side that would cause the maximum shear. Okay. So I know the maximum shear is 70 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared. That's 70 megapascals. Multiply that by the moment of inertia of each side and divide by the radius and I get the maximum torsion. All right. So what I'm finding on each side is how much torsion would cause a shear stress of 70 megapascals. And that will hold for both sides, OK? All right, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and relate these things together. I'm going to, and it might help to kind of visualize something. The, what I'm going to do in my mind's eye here is I'm going to take a pipe wrench and I'm going to slap it on here like that. So there's my pipe wrench that wraps around that central point. And I'm just going to start pulling on or pushing on that thing, okay? 
So I'm going to have a wrench on there that I can grip that with. And I'm just going to start pushing harder and harder and harder. And I'm going to just keep torquing that thing. And I want to know which side maxes out first. Okay? When do I have to stop as I push harder and harder and twist that more and more? That's how I think about this. Because I know on the left, I got to stop when I hit 110. And on the right, I got to stop when I hit 880. But those two aren't directly related to one another. So I got to figure out which side maxes out first when I start doing this. Okay. So what I know is the relationship between the torsions on either side. On the left, TAC is 0.1562 times whatever TBC is. Well, if I push TBC to its max, it'll be at 880. 0.1562 times that is 137. See, that's too big. I can't go that far. I can't take BC to its maximum value. It's too much on AC. So what I'll do is I'll look at what happens if I max TAC out. If I do that, TBC will be 6.399 times that. That's 704. That's okay. All right. So if I take a pipe wrench and put it on the middle and just keep increasing the push on it, those torsion values on either side are going to keep going up and up and up. And what's going to happen eventually is AC is going to hit 110, and when that happens, BC is at 704. And when that happens, i got to stop. Because if I go any higher, I'll push AC too much. It'll have too much shear in it. Okay. So I just kind of keep reefing on this until it hits those values. And when it does, i got to stop. See, the deal is the 110 and the 880 don't happen at the same time. Those are just independently derived values for each side. What happens at the same time is the 110 and the 704. And when that happens, i got to stop. Because if I go any more, I'll, I'll stress AC out too much. Okay. So, so that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm doing here. All right. So if I uh, apply a torsion at C of 814, at A I'm going to have 110, and at B I'm going to have 704. Okay. So what I'm doing there, I'm taking, I, I know when I hit 110, I know on the other side I got 704, and if those are the two reactions, that means I'm, I'm uh, applying the sum in the middle, 814. So we're doing all right with that? So there's a few things going on with that problem. Um, one's the statically indeterminate piece. And the deal with that is that when we found the torsions at A and at B, we know the sum of them is what we apply in the middle. Um, we also know that there's um, a ratio between the two because they're connected together. And that ratio was the first thing we found. The 0.1562 and the points in the 6.399. Okay, so that was what we found uh, at the beginning there, right there by equating the angles together. And we also know that each side independently has its maximum torsion that it can reach, 110 for AC and 880 for BC. So we kind of work with all three of those things, and we end up figuring out that if we keep increasing the torsion at C, we're going to hit a point where AC is 110. When that occurs, BC is 704, and we got to stop. And the torsion applied in the middle when those two values are reached is 814, the sum of the two. So, so that's the deal with that. So we got uh, questions on that?
All right, so, so that's kind of the deal with torsion there. Okay. 